Task force of marine biotechnology and genome engineering. In the past, Professor Dhar has headed companies like Rinken Japan and TCS Hyderabad program on metagenomics, established research labs in India, Singapore, and Japan, and significantly published in the area of human genetics, systems biology, and synthetic biology. Thank you, sir, for accepting our invitation for today's session. We are all eager to hear from you, sir. So now I invite you to please share your experiences and knowledge. Uh, Over to uh, you, sir. One minute, one minute, Swati. Uh, yes, sir, please. Uh, Swati, I want to speak something within two minutes. Uh, Today, really, I'm very happy. The reason is that I know the contribution of Dr. Dhar. Means we Indians should be proud that such a, a renowned microbiologist are present in India. He is a, not only the scientist, he is very humble and down to the earth we say reachable reachable scientist so i'm i welcome dr dhar on this platform he will deliver the lecture i have attended once his lecture and i am highly impressed by the content of his lecture so thank you very much sir for accepting the invitation of microbiologist society and today you are here again on our platform. So I welcome you and I request you to proceed for delivering your lecture. Thank you, sir. Thank you. As the president of Microbiology Society, it was my duty. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Over to you, Pavan, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, a very good morning. And uh, Professor Deshmukh and Dr. Swati Goswami and all the colleagues and students who are there today. Um, you know, you had uh, several options on Sunday morning, but you chose to be online for this meeting that itself speaks about the motivation that you bring on board. And I hope that um, I do justice to your expectations. Um, so I'll be just uh, sharing the screen and uh, I will switch off my video so that there are no bandwidth issues. Um, just give me one second and I'm going to be there with you. Uh, is it visible? Yes, sir. So, first of all, thank you very much, um, Dr. Swati and the RK University uh, and the Society of India, Professor Deshmukh, uh, and I had an opportunity to interact uh, in a different setting, which was uh, um, with the, uh, the previous meeting was uh, the Swami Shradhanan College uh, event that was uh, led by um, Dr. Archana Man. And so this is the second time we are uh, coming together. And I hope that uh, the outcome of this meeting will be uh, fruitful and it would be uh, possible to generate some good unanswered questions. Um, so, uh, today, I will be talking about synthetic biology. Uh, just want to quickly mention before moving forward that I was the dean till last month and I finished my four year term. And uh, now it's back to academics, full time, and research. Um, and uh, I'm delighted to be here talking about synthetic biology. Uh, this has been my passion for the last uh, more than 10 years. And I got introduced to this field. Um, when I was in the US for some meetings in San Francisco. And uh, I heard that there is a follow-up meeting next day after the event uh, at, in, in MIT and Boston. Um, so I was very fortunate to be there. We had no idea about uh, what this meeting is all about. Uh, this was the first a, a new name that, uh, you know, uh, 
in, during that time, back in 2004, uh, people did not know what is synthetic biology. So this was the first time that the field was getting introduced and I was uh, accepted in, uh, in this group of people. It was a wonderful three-day event. Prior to that, I used to do systems biology. But after this, um, I decided to move on and, and start something totally new. Uh, so today's talk will be based on my experience in this first synthetic biology meeting back in Ju June 2004. And whatever has happened, I've not been able to capture most of the headlines because there is so much that has gone uh, for the last uh, more than a decade, uh, ever since the first paper was published back in year 2000. However, uh, uh, you know, I hope that uh, I will bring the sense of what synthetic biology is all about and why this new name. Because if you ask people, even now people have different uh, definitions of synthetic biology. So let me start from the very basic uh, concepts and we'll build it along as we move on. So uh, as you know, reductionism has been the key scientific uh, approach in biology. Um, reductionism means that if you see an organism and you want to explain its features, uh, how you do this is by opening up the organism and trying to see the structure. As we know, the structure um, precedes the function. You know, it's a very old statement, which is true uh, in many respects. So to know how an organism behaves, one needs to know the structure of the organism. And when you open up the organism in order to see the details, uh, more and more details show up as you move forward. So when you are at this level, uh, you see that um, when you went a little deeper, first it was called gross anatomy um, at this level. And when you went a little deeper, it was called histology. Uh, and your lenses and microscopes help you, help you in understanding uh, the, the organization of uh, biological tissues. But as the staining techniques and chemistry and uh, microscopic technology, as they improved, uh, one got to know uh, more and more layers that were embedded. So then uh, we reached the layer of the cell and this field came to be known as cell biology. Initially, people thought that, um, you know, the cell is uh, kind of a vacuole uh, with, with um, some staining body in the middle. Uh, there's not much, but as the staining techniques and the differential staining techniques became known uh, and popular, uh, and along with that, the microscopic resolution also got improved. Uh, we had a full-fledged field uh, known as cell biology. When you went a little deeper after the cell, so first is gross anatomy, then became histology, and then came in cell biology. As people moved deeper, again, reducing the field size of investigation, first it was a big organism. Now you're reducing the sample, the, uh, the uh, sample under study, and... Uh, uh, people uh, came across uh, these uh, nice objects that they call chromosomes. Now chromosomes, uh, people found that is made of DNA, uh, which is coiling around its axis 7,000 to 10,000 times to make chromosomes. And also it uncoils at the end of the division. Um, so this process was clearly understood. So people got curious as to what is uh, embedded within a chromosome and uh, what, is, uh, what is DNA? Initially, if you look at the papers from uh, 30s to uh, late 50s, DNA occupied the center stage uh, in the attention uh, of the scientists. And uh, people thought initially because it was a mega star and uh, people got a Nobel uh, for that. Uh, so it was considered as the uh, director of nuclear affairs. Uh, however, when the um, uh, science, uh, yeah, so when the science got advanced uh, and the RNA community came into picture, the, the protein community came into picture, there was a lot of biochemistry and all that. And slowly DNA uh, withdrew uh, in its fame and uh, more and more uh, components became visible that were very important for running the cell. And uh, so uh, several decades later, uh, especially uh, you know, in the beginning of 1990s, uh, DNA was more as a database uh, rather than the director. So this is how the science 
changes the perception. Back in 1950s, if we were there, we would be so overawed by DNA. But now, uh, in the current situation, we think, well, the is just information because the information is encoded. It's a very smart thing. However, uh, when the molecules are made, uh, transactions happen outside the nucleus, uh, or sometimes there is no nucleus, um, as in microbes. Uh, so a lot of molecules swim around and they manage a lot of transactions. Uh, so uh, there is a lot more to the cell than DNA. And this um, gave rise to a very full-fledged field called biochemistry. And uh, people went uh, from molecular biology uh, to the chemistry level. Now here you see a transition between biology and chemistry. This is purely chemistry. Um, uh, and one gets to see the, the bonding, the, the rotation, uh, the angles and torsion and so on. Now people said, can we go beyond this um, and see what the light is made of? And when they went beyond molecules, uh, you land up in this uh, phase of atoms. Uh, and uh, now when you go deeper into the atoms in this reductionist path, uh, what do you get? You get 99.9% uh, uh, .9 space. Um, so I think some, uh, yeah, okay. 99.99% uh, .99 is space. Uh, now you do not have a microscope that can stain the space. You do not have, um, uh, you know, some technology that can study the space. So it's better to zoom out uh, instead of zooming in. And so when, when the atoms talk to each other, chemistry is born. When chemistry happens in biological system, biochemistry is born. And when biochemistry, now you have to, you know, build up the story ground up. First, we went top down. Um, so when biochemistry uh, transacts along with the other molecules, you have the combination of genetics and so on. This is how the whole organism uh, has been created. Briefly, just to uh, quickly stay on track of this talk, briefly what we are talking here is that um, there was a phase of reductionism which was very successful, uh, very popular, generated a lot of data in terms of the genes, RNA, proteins, and so on. Now, there was a time when there was so much of data, um, especially in the beginning of 90s, when the human genome sequencing project started, that people were worried, uh, where will they store the data? Of course, it was already realized much before when the protein chemist, uh, you know, structural biologists started getting more and more data. They cannot just store on the paper. They need some databases. Uh, so some, uh, you know, molecular databases were created, chemical compound databases were created, pathway databases were created, and so on. So now you have transition from reductionism to uh, integration, wherein uh, databases and modeling is a predominant way to go forward. Uh, a third approach uh, got kick-started in um, uh, around uh, between 2000 and 2004, uh, wherein the engineers at MIT asked, um, can we assemble uh, these components and create something uh, for the first time. Can we think like engineers? Can we um, synthesize, chemically synthesize DNA and make a genome, a functional genome out of it? Can I chemically synthesize a mitochondria? Can I chemically synthesize Golgi bodies or endoplasmic reticulum? And, uh, you know, chemically synthesize the whole cell? Is it possible to do uh, you know, engineering of biological systems? Uh, so the first uh, reductionism uh, process is more popularly known as uh, molecular biology and biochemistry. The second approach is known as bioinformatics and systems biology. And the third approach is synthetic biology. So I was very keen to give you the perspective of what is synthetic biology and why synthetic biology as a new discipline was needed, uh, simply because um, one is reductionism, the other is integration, and third is engineering. The engineering component is missing. Now, we may say that there is already a genetic engineering. So why is engineering again making headlines here? You see, genetic engineering is, um, um, is very popular term, but we never engineered genetics. It was an intent, but the methods, tools, and technologies were missing. Because, you know, if you have a recombinant vector and you transfer it to the cells, you have thousands of recombinant vector molecules and you have millions of cells. And uh, 
you know, you hope that at the end of the experiment, uh, some of the cells may have this vector in the right orientation um, and will survive long enough. Um, and then you select using some phenotypic assays, you select such kind of, you know, transformation uh, events. But this is not engineering, this is probabilistic approach. This is probability, this is not engineering. It's like, you know, you throw uh, 1 million bricks and hope that maybe 10 of them will uh, stay on the top of each other. Well, that is not the way to make a wall. There is a, there is a method to make a wall. Um, so likewise, the first time uh, truly engineering concepts have come into uh, biology. Uh, the systems biology approach has given rise to virtual red blood cells where you have metabolic pathways, as you can see, these are nothing but chemical equations and programmed. And this is where I learned um, um, when I joined as a faculty in Keio University in Japan. Uh, this was the first model that I learned um, in systems biology. How do you virtually represent a cell in the computer? Uh, fascinating science, uh, cutting edge, a lot of um, you know, uh, applications. Uh, however, at the end of the day, it's modeling. It's not construction. So, um, uh, people have gone to the extent of uh, building the virtual skin models. It is still being refined. Uh, and then the virtual brain as a mega project. Uh, we know the European and American scientists are really after this. And uh, in future, uh, the humanized robots will have the knowledge extracted from these models. And it's already happening. Uh, Dharmendra Moda, an IBM scientist, made a chip based on the um, the way the brain wiring uh, is, is designed. So uh, you, you will see a lot of uh, transfer of knowledge from uh, neurosciences to the robotics industry in future. So I raised this question uh, way back. Um, since we have a lot of data from reductionist methods, is it time to construct a periodic table in biology? And if yes, what would be the elements of the periodic table? So a uh, bit of thought experiments, there is no proof of the concept because the data is missing. A lot of data is missing, uh, you know, um, uh, above the fold and, and below the fold, uh, the right kind of data. So it's more of a thought paper. Um, limitations of, there are limitations of modeling. Uh, before we go to the engineering, we need to understand the integration part. Um, sometimes, you know, the models that are built are basically the mimics of the system, not perfect mimic, mimics, but, uh, you know, representation of the system. And you realize here that we can measure the shadow length and breadth, but we have lost the dimension. So from 3D, you have got 2D. Uh, so obviously modeling uh, always follows some information loss. The key is to find what is that allowable information loss that can uh, help us understand the system without compromising on the accuracy or completeness. Sometimes there is also incorrect understanding because your model says something that is not really true and then you revise the models and so on. So that is the systems biology aspect I just want to quickly bring forward. Uh, the question again, uh, back in uh, year 2000, a uh, little bit before that was, can biologists truly think like engineers going beyond genetic engineering, uh, going really, um, into the into the building of standards. Why are we saying uh, about biology and engineering in the same way is because there are a lot of similarities. Uh, however, there are also many dissimilarities uh, between two fields. Uh, we, and, and the major dissimilarity or the major limitation uh, that we have is, uh, you know, the laws, uh, rules and principles uh, or models are very robust uh, in, in the, uh, engineering community. So they can use the laws of physics, they can build the models and they can, uh, you know, for example, if you have to launch a new aircraft, um, you don't fly 1000 aircraft and see, okay, the ones that do not fall from the sky, they do not crash. They are the ones, uh, the, the remaining ones are the best ones, which we should uh, send to the production pipeline. We don't do that. We simply model them in the computer, send them to wind tunnel tests and fly them and it's, it works. Uh, can we do the same thing in biology? Well, we can do the same thing in biology, only if we had these, uh, uh, you know, the basic uh, uh, knowledge available for engineering biological systems. So Mendel's laws, which are very popular, they are more of a zoom in, zoom out types. You know, they do not help beyond uh, telling you what is their um, 
you know, from phenotype to genotype and genotype to phenotype. However, for an information to evolve from genotype to phenotype, uh, the information needs to travel several orders of magnitude in size and also uh, beyond genotype, you have uh, molecular interactions, you have cellular interactions, you have organ interactions, and finally there is phenotype. So there are a lot of, uh, uh, you know, levels of complexities which need to be explained and understood. Uh, biological systems are noisy and unpredictable, and uh, obviously when you're trying to tamper, suppose you're knocking in a gene or knocking out a gene, you do not know what's going to happen to the system. In electronic circuit, it's very easy to design. You know how the information is flowing, where do you stop the information, where do you recycle the information, where do you create the gates and all that. But in biological circuit, if you have to create an engineering equivalent of a biological circuit, then you have to go uh, several levels down. Actually, this is the more realistic representation because um, it is not only making the mRNA, but it's also trying to see how much of mRNA is left for the protein event uh, or the translation event to kick in and how much of uh, protein is left for the, uh, you know, because there will be deg degradation. So how much of protein is left for the uh, transcription event to begin, uh, you know, assuming that it's a transcription factor. So to design uh, well-behaved systems, one in standards and rules of composition. Now, this is where the engineering actually uh, starts making its appearance in, in a very powerful way, uh, because genetic engineering, by def definition, did not have the standards and rules of uh, composition. So standards are like this: that you know you uh, always fix certain quantities. Okay, you do not change them; you just fix them. Say, for example, the distance between these rails it is fixed. If it was five feet. Um, 10 inch or it was five feet five inch it wouldn't make a difference because you know you can design the boogie accordingly but somebody fixed it because of certain uh, logic at that time maybe this is the reasonable space in the forest they could get and uh, least number of trees need to be cleared so they said okay let's fix this distance and this became a default standard uh, but it was fixed and after that you have uh, narrow gauge you have meter gauge and so on everything is fixed to a certain number Likewise, uh, rules of composition. Um, when you have standards, you um, worry in what order you need, to, um, you need to combine these parts in order to create a system. And uh, so uh, not only the standards, but also uh, the latching of these parts into each other and creating a complex uh, architecture, uh, that is the next level of sophistication in engineering. And the grand challenge, of course, is this one. Uh, but uh, end of the day, we know that engineering standards do not exist in biology. Um, therefore, it's good to use engineering as an approach rather than copying and pasting engineering equations or using the engineering tools, hoping that one would get such parameter values. And one cannot uh, get uh, those parameter values to that level of uh, detailing and sophistication. Absolute engineering solutions do not exist in biology because uh, engineers never face. Now, this is not to downgrade or, or uh, uh, you know, to say that engineers have done something lesser in compared to biologists, but it is just to appreciate the fact that um, uh, when you're trying to create a circuit in, in biological systems, you come across what is called as emergence. And emergence means that it is, um, you know, when the group of molecules work together, uh, they show a different phenotype than what uh, people were assuming by way of uh, their logic or by way of their modeling. A totally new thing comes up, which we did not imagine before. This doesn't happen in engineering systems because everything is fixed to a certain standard. And likewise, you have other things uh, to worry. So um, the top-down approach has been uh, decomposing the system one part at a time, and you called it uh, knockdown or knockouts. But in the new uh, paradigm, the, the um, whole idea is to compose the system, but it has to be a controlled construction because imagine you wanted to design E. coli and you created a, a level four, the BSA level four virus. Uh, one needs to be very, very careful when you are um, trying to compose the system because here you're taking the role of a creator. You're creating an organism in the lab that did not exist before, or you're creating a module or a part that did not exist before. Or even if it existed before, you are you are uh, wiring it in new combinations to to generate new applications. So one has to be very careful, uh, but at the same time, the power of the technology offers you enormous possibilities of creating 
uh, new products that um, are going to be useful for people. Uh, concepts like uh, BioTruth table have made their entry into a biological community for the first time. You know, you have these truth tables um, in the engineering community, but if you plot inducer uh, slash repressor concentration on, on one axis and, and uh, label the protein concentration on another axis, then the box in the table um, gives you a perspective of what is the state of the system. So, you, so the thought expressed in the first synthetic biology meeting was, how about creating 4,000 truth tables for E. coli or 6,000 truth tables for yeast? Can we use these truth tables to uh, design systems uh, from scratch uh, without uh, facing failures or maybe minimal uh, failure rates? Uh, well, people tried, but they did not succeed uh, the way it was imagined because biological systems are far more complex. Um, you do see evidence of um, electronic gates, say for example, um, you know, the uh, inverter switch, let's say lack open on, when the repressor is on, the product is off, when the repressor is off, the product is on. So it's kind of a not gate. And, uh, you know, you have uh, activated an inducer together working in collaboration to generate a protein expression output. And this is an example of the AND gate. So, uh, this is where people wanted to see, is there a resemblance between two and can we use some of the concepts and tools uh, and engineer uh, biological systems? It's not going to be trivial. We know that standards are not there, rules of composition are not there, but still the ultimate goal is very fascinating. So it's time to collect a lot of data. Synthetic biology is a rational design and controlled construction of biological components leading to application. When I say components, uh, I'm talking about the parts, devices, and circuits. Uh, parts as in gene, devices as in uh, operons, and circuits as in metabolic pathways or regulatory uh, networks. Uh, initially, when the term was proposed um, uh, in the first uh, meeting uh, by uh, Dr. Drew Andy, um, well, uh, people accepted it, but then a lot of questions were raised as to, is this the right term? because synthetic biology gives you a flavor of chemical biology. So uh, people uh, debated and uh, rejected this term and, and say that no, a new term needs to be coined. This is not the right term. In any case, that's the beauty of science. You know, you challenge each other and, and see, uh, may the best logic win. Uh, so uh, finally, after um, uh, a lot of brainstorming happening for several months, uh, people uh, came up with a new term um, that was biological engineering. So they said, well, uh, so some people said, let's call it constructive biology. And the objection was that, uh, is the rest of the biology destructive? Uh, well, they said, okay, let's call it biological technology. So if that is the case, then what is biotechnology? Um, let's call it biosystems engineering. If that is the case, then you are leaving the parts with the components that are making the systems. So finally, people said that biological engineering is the closest equivalent of synthetic biology. So you will see some papers mentioning biological engineering or some journals, and some uh, stick to synthetic biology. Please understand both mean the same thing. It's not different. It's just your choice. There are several opportunities uh, for students uh, in India. Uh, every year, uh, there is IGM competition in MIT and uh, uh, so DBT started this uh, program um, and this was, uh, the idea was to uh, fund every lab, whosoever uh, qualifies this competition, which is uh, that the uh, people are invited to submit the proposal uh, every year. And now uh, there's a review of the proposal and uh, four to five teams are selected uh, and each team is given one, uh, 10 lakh rupees. And we made a suggestion to DBT that there should be an Indian biological competi engineering competition as a precursor to the IGM competition. So uh, it was accepted. And as a part of that, uh, this is uh, held and Dr. Sangeeta Kasturi is the program in charge. So if you're interested, uh, please do write to her and she'll be happy to assist you. Uh, well, uh, recently uh, people have gone beyond uh, uh, the IGM, now we have Biofoundry Alliance, which is uh, uh, headed by a professor in UK. Um, 
And so this is uh, something of a different scale. And we have just uh, joined BioFoundry, uh, Professor Binay Panda and I, we have created this Indian BioFoundry network. And uh, there are many uh, interesting aspects of the BioFoundry. Maybe in another setting, uh, we will be happy to discuss this. Um, how um, in the microbiological aspects, BioFoundry is going to help in future uh, towards industrial applications and so on. Uh, talking of industrial applications, then uh, you have microbes, um, you know, gene core company using microbes to make isoprene. And this is sent to the Goodyear company to make the rubber tires, you know, as per certain documentation available on the net. Uh, there are companies that are purchasing uh, isoprene commercially, which is made from the microbes. Uh, likewise, uh, OPEX Biotech is using uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae to make bioacrylic which is uh, far more cheaper and uh, there is significant reduction in the greenhouse gas emission. Metabolics company uh, likewise is making biodegradable plastic. Now there are a number of, uh, a large number of applications that I did not uh, you know, bring uh, uh, for discussion today uh, because um, it's, a, it's a long list. So I would really encourage students to go through this uh, and, and uh, please do some self reading to see how the uh, scientific landscape is changing rapidly from reductionism to um, engineering and what kind of uh, you know products and applications are coming say for example spider silk that uh, you know you have heard of now this is being uh, the, the genes were transferred to the goat and the spider silk is being extracted from the goat milk um, likewise there are a lot of um, you know um, aspects which are uh, emerging fascinating aspects which uh, one can take forward in future. Um, so uh, Dr. Anil Uru, uh, when he was a PhD student at John Hopkins with Professor Chandra, um, he was uh, assigned this project of uh, chemically synthesizing a eukaryotic chromosome. Took him five years and he redesigned the chromosome in the computer and uh, split it into bits and pieces and sent those pieces to the um, you know, to these companies to synthesize uh, pieces of DNA. And he uh, got those, um, you know, blocks. He stitched them, organized this in yeast, uh, and then uh, finally designed a functional eukaryotic chromosome that replicates, that transcribes, but that is much lighter than the original version. And it also had some watermarks of the people who are involved in this uh, project. And, you know, you see a long author list here, um, right, so these are the students uh, uh, in the batch who also contributed in this, in this uh, big program. So once his uh, paper came out, um, then several countries started a big consortium of synthesizing, chemically synthesizing chromosomes. And I was told a few months back that they have chemically synthesized all the yeast chromosomes now. And uh, this might come up as a big news in future. So this is how synthetic biology is, uh, you know, rapidly transforming the way we do science. Long DNA synthesis has taken the center stage undoubtedly because, um, you know, earlier, if you, if you walk into a recombinant DNA vector designing lab, a typical molecular biology lab, it could take, uh, you know, six months to one year or even more to design a vector. But now uh, you have a technology so that you, uh, transfer this information to computer, design the vector in the computer, save it as a text file, send this ATGC sequence to a uh, chemical uh, synthesis company. And uh, within three to four weeks, you get a redesigned vector that would have taken you more than a year. So you, here you are looking at very clear direction possibility of accelerating innovation. And this is the, uh, one of the major outcomes of synthetic biology. Likewise, genome editing. I think all of you know this because it has made big headlines. Well, we have a simple mission. Uh, in the next 10 minutes, I'll talk about my work and stop um, so that um, enough uh, uh, opportunity is given for discussion. Um, our uh, uh, you know, mission is very simple. We make our own genes. Uh, we, this is a very plain vanilla mission we have uh, emerging from the observation that uh, if you look at the the gene content of the human and chip or human and mouse, you see that there is 99% of similarity, 98 to 99% of similarity. 
what does this mean? It means that nature did not waste time in designing new genes. She did not waste time in those things. She said, okay, I have made it in mouse, let me retain the content. Why should I make it again? But let me rewire those genes to make humans. So if you see the bulk of the attention in the genome, if you look at the genome sequence of the humans, the bulk of the attention is paid on uh, controlling this, uh, the, the mouse gene content, you know, because there is 99% similarity. We're almost like a mouse. However, the way genes are uh, controlled, the way the rewiring has taken place, that has taken the bulk of the attention. So resource allocation, 80 to 90% of the sequence of the, of the genes uh, are um, uh, given the job of controlling a minority of the of the uh, molecules. Okay, so um, we uh, asked a simple question that if that is true, that we have such a tiny portion of the genome uh, which is doing the job of making the proteins, um, then we also know that um, you know uh, the way we learn biology is by either knocking down or knocking out the gene uh, and hoping that something will happen in the cell. So <clears throat> if there is a lot of portion in the genome that has not been used for making proteins, and if there is a concept called junk, can we make the brand new genes from the so-called junk DNA? Uh, as you can see from this picture, you have uh, a certain portion, which is eight to 10% uh, in the E. coli, but it can vary from organism to organism. So I'm not putting numbers there. Uh, however, all we know is that a minority of the gene sequences are uh, given the job of making proteins. Bulk of the gene sequences have the regulatory role of controlling this protein expression and interaction. And uh, some of the uh, sequences never make protein as per the annotation uh, details available. They do not make RNA, they do not make protein, and this is more of a dark matter of genome. So we also uh, asked why uh, these signals were placed upstream and downstream. How did nature know that I have to put a start code on here and stop code on there? How did she know that? Was this a random event? Uh, maybe a random event followed by some selection uh, processes and then um, maybe uh, it was taken as a good result and uh, certain genes were retired over time and we call them as pseudogenes. Is this what happened? If this is what has happened, we do not know. We were not there when these uh, genomes were designed. Uh, if if random and uh, randomness and directed evolution is what has happened, then there's a lot of information which is unused because nature only used uh, signals, uh, you know, at specific spots and made something um, uh, which we call as protein. But there is a lot more information which is untapped. So can we tap those information uh, pieces? That means, can we make more genes from the same sequence wherein you have only one gene? Now imagine if you scale up to the whole genome level, we're talking about millions of new genes from the same uh, genome sequence. Is it possible? So, uh, well, uh, the first question is what kind of sequence should be chosen for such an experiment? We chose intergenic regions, as you can see the red colored lines, arrows going uh, you know, in reverse direction. Um, in both the directions. And you have sequences that are a little overlapping, that are non-overlapping, that are small, that are big, because we did not know that it will work. Uh, what will be the challenge? We did not know. This was the first time attempted. Uh, there was no publication. So uh, initially, um, we had to do a bit of bioinformatics. And so we said that, uh, let us select intergenic regions. Now, what is the claim? Claim is that we have to make um, we have to make a, a brand new gene and a brand new protein from the dark matter of genome. Dark matter means the one that does not express, uh, in, uh, it does not express uh, RNA molecules or the protein molecules. That does not encode the, the information of uh, both these kinds. So uh, technically it is unused uh, in the genome. So uh, we took these molecules, we took the sequences and we did a lot of um, you know, cross-check. There were a lot of odds against the idea. Uh, and uh, when I presented this to my lab members in Japan, um, all of them refused to work in this area because they said there's no uh, publication. So um, how can we uh, invest a time when there is no 
prior publication. So we hired a um, um, technician from Singapore. She was a, a, a tissue engineering expert, Cho Su, and she's the one who did all the experiments. And as a mark of respect for the, for the lab technician, for the work that she has done, she became the co-author on the paper. And then other people joined in. So the question is, how do you make a gene out of a non-expressing DNA? This is a very simple question because you, in the textbooks, you know how a gene looks like. You uh, technically, if you uh, place some signals upstream and downstream, um, you made a gene. Uh, but if you are trying to do this at the genome sequence level, it's a lot of work because every modification or edit that you do, uh, it has to be um, you know, properly done so that uh, the order, the gap between two signals, uh, and, and, and the fact that it should not mutate, you have to take care of many things. So we say there's going to be a lot of work for us because maybe after two years, we can make one gene or after one year, we do not know. Let's do a fast uh, you know, track approach and let's pull out the information from the genome. So where do you make the novel genes outside the genome? What does it mean? Uh, we wanted to design a vector, but we were very happy that Invitrogen had released a vector at that time. And this vector already had these combinations upstream and downstream. It had promoter, ribosome binding site, start, epitope, and stop codon. All we have to do is amplify the sequence, insert it, express it, and there you go. So uh, our uh, one or two years of effort was uh, saved because of this, um, uh, the, the vector that was released in, uh, around the same time. Uh, so uh, using this, uh, of course, there are many more technical details I'm not explaining today due to lack of time, but uh, when we use this approach, um, we were all stressed and nervous because we did not know if it will work. And finally, one day, when the Western blot results were about to be uh, revealed, uh, we uh, were very patiently waiting for the results. And finally, we found that in presence of the inducer, um, the genes are expressing, as you can see, the black uh, bar. It is the um, protein which is being expressed successfully. And where it is coming from? It is coming from the intergenic sequence of E. coli. Okay, This intergenic sequence never expressed in the natural setting. We uh, created the lab-made genes. And in the lab, it was expressing. Likewise, you can see the second and the third one. In presence of the inducer, it's expressing. In absence of inducer, the minus sign it is not expressing. Now, uh, the nature of questions changed. Uh, we asked, do they have a certain structure? And we found through bioinformatics means that they do have a certain structure. So we were encouraged to go forward. Then uh, people asked, uh, what are these guys doing in the cell? If, if they are expressing, they must be doing something. So uh, then we found that um, if uh, we express um, you know, we started with 10 genes, but we lost four, uh, so we uh, only stayed with the six. Among those six uh, genes, uh, we found that when we are expressing one gene, which we call ACA, um, now ACA1 expression is killing the cells. It is becoming lethal for the cells. The numbers are going down after two hours. We said, if it is true, then if you switch off ACA1 expression, the cell growth should go up back again, right? So uh, the question was, can we restore this growth? All right, so uh, that's exactly what we found that after two hours, when we are uh, washing the cells and uh, we are remo removing the inducer from the medium, um, we found that the cell growth numbers uh, are retained, they're restored. Thereby showing a correlation, a linear correlation between the expression of these intergenic uh, sequence derived genes and uh, the phenotype. Uh, so overall, the functional study of the lab made genes can be done when you're overexpressing it, because if you, if you knock out these sequences, you do not know if any phenotype will show up. The ENCODE project, the Encyclopedia of Coding Elements project showed that there's a tiny part which is a proteome, a bulk is transcriptome, and some of it is not coding. So all we are asking is how many not coding sequence or dark matter of the genome sequences can be converted into functional genes and proteins. Now here we are looking at millions of them because imagine 1.5% or let's say 2% to be generous in, in uh, human genome. It stands for protein coding genes, right? You have 98%, close to 98%, uh, which is non-protein uh, genome 
Imagine converting 98% into proteins and peptides and looking at the functions. So this uh, gave rise to um, you know, a mega bioinformatics uh, program. Uh, and the, the whole intent was to uh, predict what kind of genes can be created and what kind of proteins will be created if we had opportunity of artificially expressing them. Um, so we found uh, that from the endogenic sequence of Drosophila, we got a peptide which was strikingly similar in terms of structure. Sequence, totally different. Structure, nearly same. And when we do the computational structure analysis, we found that um, these are very, very similar to alpha defense. And so we became tempted to express that peptide. And we actually did the experiments. We found that this peptide that is derived from the intergenic sequence of, uh, from, of Drosophila is killing E. coli, Staphylococcus aureus, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa, thereby proving that uh, you know, one can make novel therapeutic peptides from the, the dark matter of uh, yeast genome. Uh, of, of Drosophila genome. So likewise, we found uh, anti-malarial peptides against specific targets and uh, malarial parasites. And we found that when we are uh, expressing these peptides, 60 out of uh, 100 parasites are unable to enter RBCs. So this was a big finding and we are trying to refine that nowadays. Uh, the third idea came up that uh, tRNA has historically played a role of um, you know, social outreach program for millions of years. It has been uh, carrying amino acid to the ribosome surface, handing over amino acid to make a polypeptide, going back and taking another amino acid and repeating the same process over and over again. tRNA was never able to uh, translate its own sequence because of steric hindrances, because of many reasons, which we don't get into detail today, but tRNA never expressed into protein. So the question was, uh, can we make a peptide out of tRNA? Of course, it's not very long, it's not very large, but a peptide. We cannot do this in the cell with the current uh, methodology. So we took the sequence of uh, 100 uh, E. coli tRNA sequences. We did a lot of bioinformatics, selected the top one, and uh, based on a number of filters and chemically synthesized tRNA peptide. Uh, something that would have formed in the cell if tRNA had a possibility of getting translated. And what we found was really striking that it is killing Leishmania. Imagine a tRNA encoded peptide is killing Leishmania. This was never known in the community before. And you can see this uh, uh, scanning electron microscope pictures uh, that before uh, exposing the Leishmania to uh, tRNA peptide, how does it look like? And after uh, 30 nanomolar exposure, how does it look like? It's just burst the whole membrane and, and Leishmania is gone. The best part is that um, the, um, the, the IC50 value is 30 nanomolar, which means when you, and these are therapeutic uh, uh, concentrations, when you increase the size of this, uh, sorry, when you increase the concentration of these peptides 10 times, we found that human cells are not affected, which means even if you increase the numbers, of these peptides 10 times, still human cells can tolerate the presence of the tRNA peptides. So this become very uh, you know, attractive for us for filing the patent. Likewise, the other things came up and, and so on. So this um, uh, work was then transferred to um, Foresight Biotech, uh, one of my postdoc who was from the School of Life Sciences in JNU. Uh, he and I, uh, we together, uh, build this company called Foresight Biotech. And uh, we got the funding from different sources. And now we are channeling this invention to the company. <clears throat> uh, the, the original paper came in 2009. And uh, I was invited for a talk in European Science Commission back in 2010. And uh, there were more and more invitations coming up almost uh, every one or two years. So this, this got a good global press. Um, and I was uh, offered, um, you know, massive uh, funding overseas. Unfortunately, because of the family reasons, I could not leave India. Uh, and uh, so here we are trying our best to uh, scale up things. And, uh, um, you know, we are hoping that this will become a new dr drug discovery pipeline in the future. We have a little bit of inventory with us and we're looking for funding. 
the best part is that every molecule uh, is a new IP. And where is it coming from? It's coming from microbes. Where it is uh, being used, it is used against the microbes. One set of microbes, we can make the molecule. One set of microbes, we can kill those who are harmful. So this is microbes to microbes going through a synthetic route. Uh, because everything was called junk in the beginning, uh, so my students like to call this uh, project as junk omics, as a new way of doing biology. This is the group, um, the Japan group and the Singapore group and the Kerala group, and now the JNU people who are helping. Uh, it has been a, a fascinating journey, but there are also challenges um, because when we started it, people thought that we will fail, but we persisted and something else happened. So um, we receive motivation from an atom that says, uh, be positive, even if you're always surrounded by negative things. So thank you very much for your kind attention and this opportunity. I would be happy to take questions and I'm stopping the slides here. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, may I ask a question, sir? Sure, ma'am. Uh, sir, actually, I completed my master's recently, and I had a dissertation project in which we did go for computer-aided drug designing and drug delivery. But for, unfortunately, it was not concluded to the wet lab results because of all the pandemic situations. So, sir, what was our uh, novel approach? It was that we were finding a novel drug target in a pathogen, in a plant pathogen specifically, Xenthomonas. And uh, we did get, we did scrutinize a whole lot of uh, molecules, but we, uh, we were not uh, supported with a whole lot, lot of papers. So is it possible? And I want to continue the same project for my PhD approach as well. So is it possible for me to uh, decode its young DNA and get a protein from there and then target it for the elimination of the plant pathogen? Oh yeah, <laughs> thank you very much Dimani. Uh, this is really um, a very good question because uh, what I did not present, uh, we are still doing that um, because there's a lot more work it's all, you know, going in the form of patterns. So I'm a bit careful in presenting, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the data. Um, we have uh, gone in the direction of testing against plant diseases, you know, uh, especially potato. Um, so this is another area. If you want to um, explore the possibility of making uh, novel antifungal molecules uh, or molecules that will be effective against the plant pathogens. Uh, there's a lot of scope. There's a lot of scope. Um, however, one has to understand that um, it is important to do bioinformatics first, do it properly, um, go from um, simple sequence analysis to the structural prediction and the function prediction, and then do the uh, target and uh, ligand interaction assays and uh, do a bit of uh, molecular dynamic simulation to see if it is uh, a good fit or a, a weak fit, and then do the experiments. So it has to be done in that order, because then you know your uh, false positive rate will drop down. And in fact, uh, whatever molecules we have created so far, uh, we have achieved 100% success because of this reason, that there are many, many mathematical filters in place. So I really encourage you to uh, think along these lines as long as you have a clear target, it's possible to make new, new molecules against the target. And it can be anywhere. Yes, sir. thank you so much, sir. And sir, also, uh, are there any specific bioinformatics tools for in order to reach to that junk DNA or see if they are translated and transcribed? Uh, yeah, we have uh, a certain pipeline into place and uh, um, well, before we uh, got deep, uh, deeply involved in uh, bioinformatics, um, we were using uh, the open source tools available uh, for free, um, something for uh, sequence similarity uh, assays, and something for structure prediction, something for function prediction, and so on. So different levels, we were using different tools which are free and which were uh, accurate, uh, in particular, uh, we have used ITESR a lot 
because that was, uh, you know, the ab initio modeling uh, method is very robust there. And though it comes in certain limitations of uh, how many sequences you can run and so on. But first, um, we did a lot of manual exercise. But now of late, uh, some students who are um, computer savvy, they are writing scripts and connecting the dots and uh, they are able to achieve a faster, uh, you know, um, arrival at the answer. So, uh, yeah, we can talk about it. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, we have one more question from uh, another participant. Brahmajit. Yes, sir. Uh, Brahmajit, sir, uh, are you here? Please uh, ask the question. You can unmute yourself. You can ask the question, Swati. Okay, sir. Uh, so there is one question uh, that is uh, how efficient and accurate the virtual brain and cells are. Thank you very much. It's another wonderful question. You see, uh, virtual modeling technology is based on the biological data and it's based on equations. Uh, as long as the biological data which goes into model is accurate, the outcome will be accurate or a reasonably accurate one. Uh, but if the initial data is uh, not collected carefully, uh, like, like say uh, you're trying to model metabolic reactions and you found that the uh, KM value or KCAT value was accurately determined by the student or the faculty or uh, even approximate number. When you put those numbers in the model, it amplifies the inaccuracy because you don't see uh, the model behavior is not matching the in vivo behavior or the real life behavior. So it happens almost all the time. Uh, I would not say this is an exception. This is happening all the time. So we encounter this by, um, by changing this model um, uh, frequently. So by doing what is called as parameter estimation and parameter optimization. When you do those approaches, and there are a number of approaches under each category. And finally, you build a robust model uh, that is very similar to the, uh, the real life system. But because modeling activity essentially happens from a set of uh, incomplete data. It is not a complete data set, it's an incomplete data set. As against the engineers who use a complete data set. Here we use incomplete data set. So obviously the modeling conclusions are also going to be partial. But as in when the reductionist methods generate more data, you will have a better modeling um, you know, robust modeling approaches, better conclusions. So it will um, it will improve with the with the course of time. But one needs to keep working on this and generating good data, trying to eliminate the bad data because a systems biology platform by itself does not know whether the data you are feeding is good or bad. Uh, only the modeling outcome can tell where are the gaps. So I think that's the way it goes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. So we have next participant, uh, Miss Archana. Uh, she asked the question. Uh, Archana, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to everybody. Good afternoon, Professor Dhar. Uh, you, it is very fascinating. Yeah. Your your talk. I am uh, attending. Uh, Another time, I, ha I have heard you earlier, and very fascinating talk, full of potential, full of possibilities, and uh, very beautiful slides, very uh, nice description, sir. Thank you. Uh, now, I, my question is that you, you said that the anti leishmania tRNA peptide, uh, it was found to be effective, and it was damaging for the leishmania, but it was uh, not uh, harming the mammalian cells, the human cells, uh, in the sense that the cells could survive. But uh, were there any side effects? Were they studied? Are they known? Or is there a possibility of that? 
because that would matter for this peptide to be used for therapy against leishmania thank you yes ma'am uh, definitely uh, it's a very good question uh, because before a uh, potential therapeutic molecule graduates to the level of drug one needs to do a lot more studies than just in uh, in silico or cellular studies so what we have done is we have provided two levels of proof one at the computational modeling level and second is the in vitro level however uh, when we go to the level of uh, you know treating the human uh, models let's say the uh, patients uh, before that there will be an animal uh, layer when we cross that then we go to the clinical trials and over there we will come to know the actual issue because many times when you get good data it does not mean that it will survive up to the level of making a drug out of it uh, so we have not reached that stage as yet so i think it takes some time for us to fail and see how to overcome that yeah. thank you very much yeah. thank you all the best for your endeavor sir and i want to thank msi rajkot uh, the whole of msi and the organizers and my greetings to professor deshmukh also thank you thank you ma'am may ma i ask you may i ask a question yes ma'am please yeah uh, very good afternoon sir uh, it was really insightful lecture for all the verticals down synthetic biology uh, so you may correct me if uh, i am wrong so is it that as we know in case of spike proteins of corona also so there are uh, different sequences and uh, viruses they can be a good model system uh, so as to modulate uh, and i think the same can be applied for junk dna also if it is uh, mammalian so can we use uh, virus as a system so as to fast forward the things so that it will be cost effective also uh well uh, let me understand the question correctly before i respond uh, how exactly would you like to use the virus uh, are you saying the junk dna in the virus is that the uh, thought behind this or uh, is it something else i really want to understand this before i answer so that means any gene it can be introduced in virus and it will do its job further like so yes ma'am uh, because you know we can offload some of the uh, genome sequence in the virus and we can load the virus with additional uh, dna sequences or rna sequences whatever the case may be uh, theoretically it's possible how much of uh, genomic load a virus can take that needs to be determined uh, virus to virus uh, but the question here is that uh, what are we trying to uh, achieve are we trying to achieve um, you know anti viral uh, therapeutic protocol uh, if that is the case then it is best to uh, leave virus uh, in my view and focus on the viral human protein interaction interface because if you interrupt that uh, conversation you have made an anti viral drug out of it uh, because uh, handling virus will involve a different level of sophistication so for example if you go from BSL two to BSL three to four, then you have to take regulatory approvals at all the levels. Over here, if you're just focusing on a membrane protein, which is a receptor for the virus molecule, then uh, you can do it in even BSL one lab. Uh, so, from that perspective, I would say that uh, focusing on the human receptor uh, membrane receptor protein uh, and interrupting the conversation would be really uh, the way to go. and uh, we have done for certain cases and i know it works uh, we are also looking at uh, you know making antiviral therapy in future uh, not by killing the virus because you cannot kill the virus you know it's not an it's not an animate thing it's neither life or not not inanimate somewhere in between you cannot kill uh, in that sense but you can prevent the conversation or you can interrupt the conversation that's the best we can do for that okay so thank you Swati, only one question now. Uh, yes, sir. Prakash Halani, <laughs> have... you want to ask the question? Yes, Prakash. sir. Yes, sir. We have Dr. Prakash Halani from uh, uh, CFTRI. Uh, I welcome you, sir, from uh, on behalf of MSI and RK University. So please uh, address your question. Good afternoon, Professor Dhar, and good afternoon, everyone at MSI. 
I just I was curious how synthetic biology approach has a relevance with relation to the COVID-19. Because we see that the different molecules with reference to the spike protein and in over our organizations. So just a, a brief uh, information from Professor Dhar with relation to the COVID-19 from the synthetic biology approach. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very Your much. Your comments. Your comments, please. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, uh, sir. Um, yeah, I, I would say it's a very, very important and a very relevant question in the present context of COVID-19 infection. Um, two aspects come to my mind here. Uh, one is uh, that we work at the level of uh, disrupting the interaction between the COVID virus and the human receptor molecules. That is one level where synthetic biology can be helpful. Can we, can we design more inhibitors? Well, it's possible. It is being already done. Uh, the second level is uh, boosting the immunity. Uh, well, I've been approached by some uh, immunology groups uh, who are very, very interested in uh, finding if the so-called junk DNA can be used to boost the immunity. So you take the peptides and use these peptides as immunity boosters. Is it possible? And where does it come from? It comes from, so to say, junk DNA or the dark matter of genome. Well, uh, I would say uh, theoretically and computationally, a lot is possible. Practically, can we achieve it? Um, we're really short of funding. <laughs> so if there are donations to our lab <laughs> or if there are any funding avenues from the industry, we'll be delighted to work on this problem, which is absolutely relevant and timely in the current time. Thank you very much. Sir. Wonderful, Professor. Just a last Theory was uh, if we combine the genome editing and the otherwise uh, conventional molecular biology approaches, where the synthetic biology has the scope. Sir, uh, genome editing, uh, wonderful again, uh, because genome editing, uh, people have used uh, many technologies for nearly 20 years and the latest yes, yes, yes. And uh, But what is happening, you know, interestingly, is that US Army and of course uh, some other, uh, you know, uh, organizations. They are trying to create technology to stop editing oh. into crispr Cas9 uh, molecules. Uh, why are they doing that? Because if uh, CRISPR Cas9 goes unregulated in future, and if people have this technology in their hands to edit the genome at any point in time, there needs to be an antidote for that. Exactly. People are also working on uh, creating anti uh, CRISPR and anti Cas9. In fact, uh, <laughs> I did not share this data because uh, a lot of things are happening in parallel in our lab. Uh, we have also found some anti CRISPR and anti Cas9 molecules from the junk. Very, very new information for me. Yeah, we hope that if we have good students in future, I think we'll yeah. be like. Wonderful, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for uh, giving insight in this in this field, in this emerging field. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, dear participants, I have a message for you all uh, that we have uh, uh, given feedback form link to you all and your feedback values a lot for us in order to continue the series. So please do fill the form and uh, share with us. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Pavan sir. Thank you so much for uh, for such a nice and a wonderful wonderful session. Thank you so much. Now I'm ending the meeting. Uh, Deshmukh sir, may I end the meeting now? Yes, yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for Thank today's uh, very very informative lecture. We are very happy. Thank you again. We'll be in touch in the future for. Uh, inspiring the student. Particularly, I'm interested DBT sponsored activity for the student. So, I will talk sometime on this topic, sir. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. Anytime. Okay. I'll be most Thanks, happy sir. to assist. Thank you very much sir, for having me today. Uh, so, there is information that uh, feedback forms are in the, in the email ID which I have uh, shared with you all participants. Please fill in the form. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, now I'm ending the meeting. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir.